Hey guys, welcome to That Pedal Show, and I am delighted to be sat here with uh, Mr. Simon Neal from Biffy Clyro. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, it's really strange. I've done loads of interviews. I'm a bit nervous today. Oh, don't say that. That's going to make me nervous. There we go. Yes! Oh, oh yes! <laughs> that'll, keep, that'll just get me in the right headspace. That's fantastic. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. Uh, listen, thank you so much for your time today. Of course, man. Um, so, there's a few things I want to talk about. Mm. One of the things, a question we get asked a lot about your rig. Um, Strats, mm -hmm. you're playing this amazing heavy tones with strats. How did that happen? I guess to start with, it was kind of a happy accident, really. You know, I've always loved the sound of a strat that it's very percussive, so mm. dynamic. And mm. being in a three piece, I always thought it was important that the guitar wasn't, you know, just really had a bit a bit of something to it. It sounded like it was always going to just sound wrong. You know, I think that's why I like the strat because it always sounds like it's just going to perhaps tip over the edge, right. you know. Um, and I guess I slowly just started piecing some amps together. So I started like with uh, at a PV Bandit to start with. Who didn't start with a PV yeah, Bandit? Yeah, well, absolutely. I know you're not a player unless you're the <laughs> bloody PV Bandit. Um, and then I added like a, 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 what did I get after that? I think it, it wasn't a DeVille, it was an early Fender amp. And then I added a Marshall. And the Marshalls gave it this thickness mm. that I couldn't get perhaps out of, out of other amplifiers. Sure. And, and I just found this tone with my Boss Metal Zone pedal from back in the day. And I just managed to get this middle ground, and I didn't quite realise how unusual it was to get a Strat that sounded so fat until, until serious players would come up to me and say, how are you getting that tone? So so it was basically an accident in the start, and now we have charred my uh, wizard behind the scenes who gave man just to make it happen like within the blink of an eye. Right. So Mick's about to lose his mind uh, when he sees this incredible array of uh, lovely custom shop Stratocasters. So, what, so yeah, take us through it. Uh, we go old to new. Okay. We've got the two old ones from way back when when I started. And wow. They're, they're still going. This is one of my favourites. Um, this one's down tuned, down tuned to drop C, so you'll see it on that golden rule, that, that sort of number, you know. Um, yeah. And they're just, they've done some gigs. And yeah. Wonderful. We love them. And then the newest one we've got from, from Fender. Is that that's quite nice? That's tuned E to E at the moment. Are they all set up the same, or got um, you yeah. know? They're all very similar, relatively high action because he's such a hard player. Right. So some people pick him up and like, oh, I'm not sure about that. But mm -hmm. you know, the, the way that, that he digs in. Um, so we drop these two pickups, so you can play oh. it as hard as possible. So we, that's always down. But he never down, uses. He was, you know, changing pickups, like we don't do that on Biffy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that on full, that one down, and off you go. Mick's got a question. Hello, this is Mick here. Um, does Simon use any noise cancelling pickups at all? Um, they're all the Texas specials. I don't yeah. know if they are. No, no, no they're just no. single hey, coil, high out. Rock and roll, yeah. wicked. No. And if you like a bit of amp noise and a bit of inductive hum and you know it shows that you're playing a guitar doesn't it so yeah. if it does go when you when you move around one why not that's what it works for the stones work for Jimi hendrix there you it? go if i could clap if I, if I could clap at this point instead of holding a camera i would all right good <laughs> there you go you know i do i love les pauls and everything i love tailies but there's just something the strat just speaks to me in ways that those other guitars don't and i think it's Closer to a vocal, I know that sounds mm. ridiculous, but to me no, it's, no. it's kind of like well, a vocal. That's, that's really interesting because I was, I was going to ask you, all my favourite guitar players are also singers. Wow. Yeah? And you, your good self included. Thank and I've, you. I, your guitar playing consistently amazing and, and very unique. It's very Thank you. you so much. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, speaking about the, the vocal qualities of the Strat, mm -hmm. as a singer, do you find that that informs your guitar playing? Is it the other way around? I think it's the other way around. I think my guitar playing probably informs my singing more. Wow, I, I okay, never, cool. I never thought of myself as a singer. I mean, I guess I, I still don't really, well, to be I, honest. But, you know, it's always, it was just guitar I wanted to play. I wanted to write songs and, and I guess the best way to kind of sing them was to just sing them myself. But it, definitely it's been the guitar that's influenced how I sing and, mm -hmm. and um, 
I played violin before I played guitar. Wow. Yeah, I played violin from the age of like five for about five or six years, and I gave that up quickly once I discovered the guitar. But I think that really informed my playing mm -hmm. a lot more. Like I, I've always used all my fingers, mm. you know, and. I never kind of leave a finger doing doing nothing, you know. Yeah, if right. I can fling it on a chord, which sometimes it's probably overkill, but you know, if I can fling it on there, I will and get a different voice in one of the chords. But, um, but yeah, violin probably informed my guitar playing, which then informed my singing. Wow. But singing was a means to an end, you know. Guitar, I wanted to play guitar, and I guess I kind of had to sing, you know. Right. Or rather, I had to play guitar, and and singing kind of was just a byproduct. Fantastic. Um, okay, new album. Mm. Yeah. Ellipsis. Finally. All very excited. Oh, good. I'm, I'm buzzing. How was the process? Process was the most the most awkward process we've had. We, we really? deliberately moved away from recording in, in a live setup. And all our previous six albums, it was important that we got everything feeling right in the mm. room. We played together. Mm. We overdubbed most of the guitars afterwards, mm -hmm. but it was important that we were making it happen in the room. And this time, we, we just wanted to break those rules down the middle. So we. On certain songs, I would play acoustic guitar and sing first, and then we'd add bass, and then we'd maybe do the drums, and wow. then maybe extra guitars, or sometimes we'd, we'd build the guitars up before any drums. And and it was a really, for me as a, as a songwriter, I found it really helpful. You know, it was a bit disconcerting as a guitar player because I like to kind of go, you know, like tick boxes, like, you know, I've got a thick sound, and then I move on to a baritone guitar or mm. something. And, and normally I like to build it like that. So it was a bit strange not remembering exactly what I'd done. Right. But that was what the purpose of this record was to just kind of for Biffy to take a slight left turn and be out of our comfort zone. And, you know, make no mistake, when we're playing live and everything, we're very much the same band. But in terms of the creation and the inspiration, it was really trying to unlearn what we'd learned. Mm. And in our last three records, working with Garth Richardson, who's such an aficionado of guitars and amps, and he's just got all these gorgeous things he's collected from his 30 years in the business and his, his dad, Jack Richardson, was an incredible producer. And so he's probably got 40 odd years worth of gear, which is, was amazing and we were really spoiled. So I think, I think that was also another reason. It was like we, we had the best of the best in the last three records mm. and we wanted to really just kind of mess around with and fuck with it a wee bit, I guess. So your, the guitars on the album, I mean, will you just use whatever you want and sort of then pair that back live? Do, do you use Les Pauls and Telecasters when you're recording or is it still mainly you, the predominant sounds probably Stratocaster, mm. but I think with a with a record you're you're looking for different layers. Yes. So, you know, live it's all about that moment and that feeling, that kind of explosion of sound. Whereas a record, you know, I love the way a Strat sounds, but there's certain tones that a Les Paul brings that you just can't find in a Strat. Absolutely. And, and and you know, and um, what, what other guitars was I using? I was using some like some really used a uh, Mosrite. Oh yeah, which yeah, are you know, kind of surf guitars, yeah. and they. Again, it wouldn't work for everything, no, of but it's course, certain but they do have a thing. Yeah, They're real weird, sound. Yeah, and, definitely. Um, and I, I play a couple of solos in this album for the first time ever, so things like that. A Stratocaster worked for certain mm -hmm. certain solos, but there's a couple of them that just wanted that kind of smooth Les Paul sound. So, so I'm I'm less afraid of branching out now. You know, before right. it used to be like if it wasn't a Strat, I'm like, ooh. Why would I do that? Yes, you know, of course, of course. But you know, the more records we make, the more we want to just say something different. And and I actually got myself a really nice Les Paul out there. Got a '77 Les Paul. Oh, lovely! Which was the first, you know, my first treatment of a guitar for a few it's a years. Black. So no, it's not black. I'm afraid it's like Zach Wild one. The, oh, okay. The, 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 Randy um, Rhodes, forgive me. The, the, the Randy white, Rhodes. The cream off the off cream. Yeah, yeah, the off yeah, cream. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Forgive me. Nice. Um, but it's beautiful and. But having said that, if I didn't have the Strat in there, I, I would struggle. You know, so that's that's definitely my sound is the Strat. Sure. You know? Translating it to, to live can be mm. the tough thing. You know, there's certain, certain subtleties in an album that you just, that perhaps I don't think is important live. You know what of I mean? Course. Like to me, it's about, it's just about that moment. And if it feels right, then it's right live. You yeah, know, a record, course. it's like you're peeling layers off and everything. And to things, there's certain things that perhaps we did in our earlier records, mm. which I haven't played bigger shows. And I guess we're kind of at that stage where we're playing a lot more big shows now. So. It's impossible for that not to feed back into what you're doing. Sure. We try, part of the reason we took a year off was to try and limit how much that feeds back in. Because okay, you don't want yes, to write a record going, oh, this is for, this is for the thousands, you know, the millions of people that are going to watch us, you know. So that kind of, the first couple of songs I wrote for this record, actually, I kind of found myself almost doing that, like imagining how we would play them and where they would be. And, and that was wrong. That's mm. not, that's not, you know, 
Ambition's a good thing, but it's kind of the enemy of creativity to a certain extent. I, 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 I kind of believe that. Mm. Certainly in my mind, that's mm. how it works. If I think too much of one thing, it impacts. And so we took a year off to kind of strip that down and kind of forget about the size of shows and how we would present it. And I think that's why the, the songs have come out kind of exactly how we want them. You know, just no external influence. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's curious either because. Uh, there's nothing like I mean, now we've got Mike Bennett playing with his live as well. That's that's when I've realised the power of just a classic chord. You know, like we're just both Absolutely. playing the same chord. It's like there's a feeling that happens. You know, you can do it. You can be as <laughs> mental as you want, but sometimes <laughs> just doing that is is fantastic. You know, but um, but yeah. So live. I mean, as as we were talking about earlier, I've I've been through so many different configurations, so many different types of pedal board and things and. And the only thing that can survive, I, I sweat a lot live. I'm sure if you've seen our band at all, you know that. And and I really stomp on my pedal board. You know, it's it's kind of like an extension extension of my body. Mm -hmm. And and I go through pedal boards that are going out of fashion. And I, as you as you full well know, <laughs> I pretty much need a machine gun or something to try and penetrate this. So it's uh, it's just been a real a real turning point for us. We've been using these your pedal boards in, in the states for years. And you know what? It was ironic because going to a smaller setup in the States and almost being more comfortable with what we were doing and more wow. reliable and just, more, you know, as I say, just bulletproof. And then to come back and play the big shows and be feeling like, like we don't have the faith in the gear. And it's kind of a bit boring, you know, because when you start, it's not important about, oh, that's just about getting a sound out. But once the shows get better, you, you just want the best. You want it to Absolutely. be the best every night. And, and that comes across when you play. You can you can tell you guys are taking it just so seriously, life and death. Oh, good, and good, good. It's it's amazing, and that you know the, the audience really picks up on that. You know, but it's so important. The thing is, absolutely, we we're really lucky that you know, it, don't want to sound bashful, but we're really really lucky to be doing what we do. And you know, mm. there's a lot of my favourite bands didn't sell any records and never get the chance to even make a third record. And, right. And the last thing we want when we step off a stage is to think that we didn't give every ounce of our energy. And, and I'm glad that comes across because it is. It's nothing more important. And anyone who spends hard-earned money to buy our albums or come to the shows and takes time out their day to do that, you know, babysitters or whatever, skipping school, whatever you're doing, you know, it means a lot to us because we were we were those kids. We still are, you know, yeah, to a certain yeah, yeah. extent. And it just, I want it to. I want people to know how much it matters to us because. Then I hope they can value it in a similar way. You know, it's not not just entertainment. You know, it's a whole Absolutely. lot more than that. You know. Okay, guys, we're here with guitar tech extraordinaire and my good friend, Mr. Richard Pratt. Uh, Richard's going to take us through the intricacies of uh, the rig that we have sort of yep. spent the last however many months. Yep going over. I've spent the last five years dreaming of it and the past couple of months building it with you. It's been good. It's been fantastic. Yeah. So we've got a, a bass unit pedal board that uh, Simon has at his feet mm -hmm. and then what we'll do is we'll have a look at what that's controlling back in the racks. Yes. After you sir. No worries. So as Dan says what that's controlling really this is controlling that. This is very true. <laughs> Which is exciting. Um, I've got more buttons than Simon's got so I can select different sounds and solo things and listen to things uh, and each loops just get, taking different pedals or selecting the different amplifiers as well um, with the compressor running over everything just taming the strat slightly and helping us with the sustain and so this is the the uh, Cali 76 from Origin which we've um, mm -hmm. spent a bit of time with on the show which really wonderful sounding compressor um, now, interestingly enough, um, a lot of people have been asking about the metal zone. Okay, All yes. Right. So, Simon's had this in his rig for a while. Yes. We've had this in since day one. Right. And that hits the Marshall 1959 head. Um, it's the reissue we're using because you know, we haven't got an old one. Uh, and that's always been in Biffy sound. And you turn it on. And we used to have the 4B12 on stage for years and years and years. And it's just parts the hair doesn't it and it lets you know that you've you've arrived <laughs> and especially when you're doing small clubs you want to terrify the front row yeah so it was like right that's what we want fantastic and we're being a three-piece you've got to have everything louder because mm. you've got to fill that that gap of course so that's where it was and we can't get rid of it 
But, you know, you need you need that fizz. You need that serious high gain attack. And, then, and there it is. So one of the prerequisites for this rig mm -hmm. is that we had to have a bunch of the units. They all have to communicate. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I thought this was a really great idea um, because you've got your main rig, which is running all the time. Mm -hmm. And if there's ever an issue with one of the amplifiers or something happens, you've got everything duplicated in a B rig, which is why we've got two supersonics and two marshals. Yeah. Um, yep. So what happens is this is the main rig and everything's running, but it, when you press a button or when Simon presses a button on the main rig, you'll see it. it <laughs> and that was on. <laughs> that was. Go Dan. Um, so. When you press a button, so I go between the clean, you'll see everything changes. The boards out the front change. The, um, so the spare rig mm -hmm. is always keeping up with the main rig. That's correct, yep. Right. So often I do some of the changes as well, so his board keeps up with mine. So if he's playing, 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 and he's out the front, arm will go stop, then guitar change. And the spare rig's keeping up. And the amps are all plugged in hitting speakers so if something sets on fire you just unplug it and the spare carries on which is great and then if for some reason let's say someone throws a pint on stage and takes out the main pedal board mm -hmm. sparks going everywhere if i go to the spare rig the main one doesn't keep up with the spares so i can fix the main rom whilst or sort out any issue that we've got and then we go back to the main and the main takes over and the spare keeps up with it which um Took two cups of coffee, a cake, and some thinking about, didn't it, Dan? It, yeah, it sure did. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a joy helping you yeah. put this together, and you know, seeing it all come to life. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the big features in Simon Riggs has always been the use of multiple amplifiers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's have a look at what we're using. The clean sound comes from the Fender Supersonic, uh, just using the front channel on the. What, what do they call it? The bass man side. Mm -hmm. Slightly overdriven, just Stratocaster through that. The Marshall, as we've discussed, for the big noise, you've got the that pedal hits that head and comes on. Mm -hmm. Jobs are good. Un. And then we've got two different Kempers doing two different sounds, but they're more flavours to add on top of the distortions. Right. And special effects and intros and that sort of stuff that we use the Kemper for. The Kemper doesn't run all the time. It just comes in for the for some of the fun bits. So the Fender and the Marshalls, that, that's the bass tone yeah. Yeah. for this. I mean, yeah. you can't go wrong having a Fender, supersonic clean head for your clean sound. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. it's amazing. It's 100 watt Marshall? Yeah. Of yeah. course, sorry. Yeah. Of course it's a 100 watt Marshall yeah. for your, you know, for your yeah. dirty tone. Yeah. And But using the Kempers as bits of sparkle and flavor, yeah, certain specific it. sounds for certain yeah. specific songs. I was in the studio with the lads uh, in October mm -hmm. and we'd get a sound and go, yes, that's the sound, model it on the Kemper and then we've got it so we can go that part of that track. Maybe we want that bridge or that middle eight, we can just dial it in and off you go. Fantastic. And then always add that on top of your bass sounds. Like we don't go straight to the Kemper because you, you just lose all that, all the weight and width and everything that we've tried so hard to create with mm. the valve amps. Mm. Um, the Kempers do sound good, you know. The last rig that we had before this, I had another rack full of, full of heads. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, if we've got the Kempers, let's just model those heads. And then we don't have to, it's less on shipping and so yeah, on and yeah. so forth. You know, so we had the, the Hayden Mofo, which is one of Simon's favourite sounding amps. Mm -hmm. And he, that's the one he uses up in Scotland, up in the practice room. Mm -hmm. So we, we modelled that for some of the in-between distortions, some mm -hmm. of that medium, really yeah, gritty yeah, yeah. stuff. And we put that into the medium sound. And it's just, yeah. We've added the ISO cabs. Because when you saw us last time, we had all the speakers. We wanted to get some room in front of the speaker. Mm. Um, and we had them all in a big line. And we've had so many complaints. And it's... It was so loud off stage. It was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, so this time we've tried the ISO cab and, and we've made it work and sort of EQ'd around that putting a speaker in a box issue that you can have. Um, can we have a look at the ISO cab? Yeah, yeah, let's, um, let's open it. 
the Box of Doom they're called. It's a Dutch company that have helped us out. And that's the Celestian and Lico Cream mm -hmm. for the Fender. A uh, big day from Mike, and off you go. It sounds Beautiful. great. And we have blown speakers up in the past. So if you blow one up, you just unplug it, lift it out, slot, nice. slot your spare in, off you go. Very nice. You have to. Uh, Mick here. <laughs> is, is that doing all of the out front sound? Uh, it's doing one voice of the guitar choir, and it's Simon Neal. So, so it's doing, Are you having that? But it's doing all of the Fender amp sound. This is the Fender, so yeah, yeah this yeah. is the Fender one. Yeah. Yeah. Then we have another one over here for the Marshall one. In the Marshall, we've got the Kerry King special. And um, we can have a look if you want, but yeah. it's in there. It's black, so it's, you know, and it's fizzing away nicely. So again, live, I have a reasonably simple setup. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got my large distortion, kind of medium distortion, a couple of delays, really. We've got a couple of kind of funky things going with our Kemper back there, where mm -hmm. I've saved a few sounds from the album. So mm -hmm. if there's a couple of songs in the set that I want to be really quite close to the record, sure. then we'll go down that path. But as a rule, this is exactly what I play, so... <laughs> You know, very matter of fact, clean sound, you know. Playing a dad gad tune in here, so I've always got weird tune. It's yeah. very big. Yeah, it's, it's a, very big. Again, the, tough to get, it took it taking a few years just to get the clean sound of the Strat right, mm. you know, because it sometimes can be just a bit too wafer thin and a bit sure. kind of twangy. And, Again, just lo just having the the luxury of time, I guess, to be able to spend time in here, you know, without a gig looming, just makes the world a difference. And, yeah. Um, so yeah, very. <laughs> delay. <laughs> now, an amazing thing about your delay is that you actually put it before your distortion pedals. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so how did that, just another accident? Um, I guess it was, I think it, it's a cleaner signal. Right, you know, it's I a think great it, sound. It's, it's, it it keeps character. it a bit more matter of fact, I think. You yeah. know, sometimes, the way I play as well, it can just end up too much like a, like a sonic blizzard, you know, and yeah, sometimes right. that's really hard to keep control. So it's that fine line of, of getting the mania and the chaos, but also it should be kind of pure, as pure mm. as it can be. So mm. I guess that's why we go before the distortion. You know, it just keeps it a bit more matter of fact. And um, well, there, 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 there is a time and a place for, <laughs> for putting it after distortion, though. We did that in the record a bunch, you know, like, and, and right. the record we were, we were we'd like chains of, of pedals, you know, like 20 pedals long. You know, it was a real, real thrill because we'd, you know, we'd have 15 pedals in and we'd be like, it's not quite right. We need another, you know. So in the records, I have a whole bunch different, you know, it was more just about, as I say, it's the subtleties of an mm. album. You can kind of afford to just, manipulate things just that bit more but um yep so clean i've got a wee loop is a loop on distortion here charge yeah hey, i've put your uh, the new pedal you wanted on the on that channel on this one no it's, it's now on the all oh, right uh, <laughs> so i have an envelope filter for the first time <laughs> um and Again, it's the first time, there's a couple of songs in this record where there's specific sounds on the album that I really wanted to bring across. And, uh -huh. and f we were joking about it yesterday. Before, like I've never, I would never put reverb in my amps. I, I got all my, my knobs taken off my first guitars for the first six years, <laughs> right. and I only had one pedal and a, and a clean sound. And I didn't. If anyone put a reverb or a delay on my vocal or anything, I was like, get to fuck. I'm not <laughs> interested. You know. And now I've gone entirely the other way. I'm like, yeah, so I've got a fucking wah for a certain new song called Flammable, which is great. But I mean, to be honest, that's is the extent that I go. You know, mm. Mike Vayner, who plays with us live, who you've been talking to, yeah. he's he's a real sonic architect. You know, he's he's a technician of the guitar, you yeah. know, and he, he knows why everything's happening. I'm a bit more instinctual. Not to say Mike isn't instinctual, but, mm. you know, Mike is kind of bit more of the architect so I leave a lot of the kind of textures and things to him and his guitar sounds on Ocean Size and you know just absolutely <laughs> remarkable and his last album as well just yeah I mean so it's, it's a beautiful record beautiful. Actually, I actually think it's the best record I loved Ocean Size so much mm. I think the Vayner solo stuff is, is one of the best records he's ever been involved in and 
the thing with that band, Ocean Size, as well, so you to have like three play, three guitar players and so much going on, and to find everything, finding its space yes. with all those yeah, yeah. The, the dense textures and things and delays, and that that is what is really, really important, really hard thing to do. And I think um, that's why we're very fortunate to have Mike playing with us. And we've got Gambler from Ocean Size as well, who plays yeah, yeah. keys and things. And so we couldn't be in safer hands. You know, it's it's as I say, I come from songwriting with my pedal, my guitar, you know, and, I, and that's all, I'm about the expression of the music, which is why I think I still use the Strat as well, you know, to me it's like it's pure expression and and I love the way Mike and Gambler can, can think of it in a different way, you mm. know, and, and I guess because they don't come to record the album with us, they're a bit more matter of fact, so they can, they bring things in, it's like, oh wow, yeah, I didn't, right. wouldn't even think of that, because we did it a certain way and then the record, it wouldn't dawn on us to do it another way. And um, Fantastic. Well, listen, Thank you so oh, much of for your time today. I know you guys are really got, busy. Let's go one big. Well, we need we need some we need to hear some bigness. Yeah, let's do it. Right, well, I'm going to stand up for this. So I'm just going to go through my three main sounds. <laughs> That's the one. So again, it's, you know, it, it, that's what I want. And the big sound for a lot of people is probably a bit too kind of like, I love that. I don't know if it's because I'm going deaf. <laughs> You're sat right in front of me there. It's amazing. It's brilliant. But yeah, it can ne never be too loud. If it's too loud, you're too old. But as I say, that this is a revelation for me though, honestly, because I, I, we played in the band. We released our first album in 2002. I've been playing guitar since 97. And I swear to God, I just haven't had anything anywhere near as reliable as this, never mind the details of the things that I can do now. There's things that Chard hasn't even told me it can do because he knows it will just confuse me, <laughs> you know? But he's, he's let me know that, rest assured, anything I can think of is happening and, and I just can't thank you enough. It's, it's, honestly, it's just, it's changed, it's gonna change my life over here because it's, it's been amazing in the States and I can't, I'm annoyed it almost took me so long to kind of knuckle down. Well, it's been an honor to do it for you. So thank you so much. You so much. Thanks, my brother. All right. Cheers, guys. We'll see you next week. <laughs>